What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Daniel Holland and I'm back with another true crime video and this video is a continuation in the series that I created a few videos back where I look into cases that inspired new laws or change throughout the community and in true crime and I feel like I could not move forward to any other case until I spoke about this one because you see it pop up all over my channel, all over true crime and our daily lives. And in my opinion is incredibly important for everyone to know about. And that is the abduction that inspired the Amber Alert. I've covered cases throughout the entirety of my channel where an Amber Alert is used. And I always get comments of people very confused about it, the different criteria you have to meet, um, just a handful of different things. And obviously people asking where it originated. So, but before I get into all of the details, I want to say a huge thank you to Care Of for working with me on today video. Care of is a subscription service that delivers high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders straight to your door. It can be incredibly tricky to figure out the kinds of supplements that you need. Care of takes out all of the guesswork and the stress. Care of has a quiz that you can take online. You're asked about your goals, your lifestyle, diet, things that are important to you in supplements. And then Care of curates a personalized list of recommended supplements. Now it's awesome to me because is with each one, there is an explanation on why it's recommended, the benefits that it provides, even where the supplement was sourced, which is important to me. So you really walk away having this full understanding of the supplements that you are going to be taking. All of the ingredients are clean and backed by science, so you can feel good about what you're putting into your body. You guys know that I've been using Care Of now for years. It, first of all, and mainly helps me stay organized when it comes to my supplements. The supplements come and it really Really convenient daily packs, which is very helpful for me. And my favorite part is that if your needs change, you can just retake the quiz and see your new recommendations. I actually just decided to retake my quiz. I do it usually about once a year. As per usual, all of my recommendations, you guys already know, I love rhodiola, so thankfully that did not vanish off of my list of needs. Rhodiola is a vitamin used for stress and to help your mood out, which Lord knows I need every single bit of. And then on top of that, also thankfully, I still have my fish oil on my list. It is shellfish free. The new vitamin recommendation that I got was a B complex. And that was added because it's supposed to help with energy support. And I need that now more than ever. So I'm really excited about that. And then also I added on some of their plant-based protein powders, which I've talked about before. They're absolutely delicious. I usually get the chocolate, but I got vanilla this time. You guys can go and take the care of quiz to see what vitamins and supplements are recommended for you. All you have to do is click the link down below and use my code Danielle50 for 50% 50 off your first order with care of. Thank you again to care of. It is brands like them that allow me to do what I do and help these families and victims the most that I possibly can. And so now diving into this case and learning about where the Amber Alert came from. And if you guys had any idea the level of excitement that this series has brought me, I've done so much research. I'm so excited to learn new things. I really am excited to teach you guys new things, especially so you can just have a better understanding, not just of the true crime world in terms of like consumption and things along these lines, but in your everyday life. So Amber Hagerman, nine years old, is the reason why the Amber Alert exists. It is obviously named after her. The Amber Alert has gone on to save and bring home over 1,100 children. Nick Mick or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children updates that number regularly um, and it's used all around the world. The impact that the Amber Alert has had is huge. It's truly changed so much in terms of rescuing abducted children, but unfortunately, Amber's killer has still yet to be caught. So not only did something fantastic come out of such tragedy, but unfortunately there's still no answers. Authorities are hopeful and we will get to that at the end of the video. So Amber was born on November 25th, 1986 to Donna and Richard Hagerman. She had a little brother named Ricky and according to her mom, Amber was a little mother herself. She was the kind of kid that was always mothering her little brother, all of her friends, all of the kids in the neighborhood. She was always that responsible one that would look after everyone. So to me, 
hearing that and, you know, hearing her described that way, it's kind of a beautiful thing that after death, she's still out here looking out for all of these children all over the world. She was really active in the Girl Scouts. She loved to sell Girl Scout cookies and her mom describes her as being full of life, fun loving, and just an all around sweetheart of a child. Now, Amber's parents ended up getting divorced and her father moved to another portion of the country. It's like some 1000 plus miles away. And Amber, her brother, Ricky, and Donna remained in Arlington, Texas. This is where she wanted to raise her children. This is also where Donna's parents, Jimmy and Glenda lived, and they were really, really close to their grandparents. So Donna, Ricky, and Amber lived in an apartment complex in Arlington, and it was only five minutes away from where their grandparents lived in a house in a neighborhood. And they would visit their grandparents at least three to four times a week. It's difficult being children and living in an apartment. I had my children in an apartment for for a very long time. Sometimes space can be an issue. The outside and playing can sometimes be an issue, having a yard, things like that. And so it was really nice to be able to go over to their grandparents' house multiple times a week to eat dinner together, be close with family. And then there was also so much space to play. They loved to ride their bikes in the neighborhood. And on January 13th, 1996, that's exactly what happened. Donna took five-year-old Ricky and nine-year-old Amber to their grandparents' house. They were all going to head over there, play, hang out for a while, and have dinner. According to articles, Donna, Ricky, and Amber arrived at Jimmy and Brenda's house at around 3.10 p.m., and upon arriving, Ricky and Amber immediately begged to be able to take their bikes out on a bike ride. They wanted to take them on a spin around the block because there's nothing cooler and better to do when you are a kid. Because there was a street and a sidewalk and tons of space to play at their grandparents' house, they also kept their bikes there. So this was like a time where they don't often get to ride their bikes at their own home. So the moment they get to their grandparents, it's like the first thing that they wanna have access to. And on top of that, Amber had just received a new bike. Christmas was only a few weeks prior to this. She had opened up her present that morning and there was this pink, beautiful bike. So obviously, she jumped at any chance to be able to ride it. Donna, of course, was not concerned. I don't think any parents usually were in 96. I was a kid around that time. I remember biking like over the entirety of my neighborhood, going through the woods. Like it was just not something that you were worried about. So she set them up on their bikes, buckled on their helmets and told them to stay within the block. They did this typical loop right around the block all the time when they rode their bikes. So they knew exactly where to go. And obviously the other rule was to stay together. But somewhere along this short ride, Amber had a change of plans. So Amber decided that instead of doing the same loop that they did every single time they went to their grandparents' house, she wanted to go further than just this block. She wanted to push the boundaries a little bit. She wasn't planning on going super far. I'll have a picture up here. You'll see kind of like the location. You'll see where the loop is that they typically would go. But she wanted to go like one block over to where there was a shopping center. There was this abandoned Winn-Dixie parking lot with plenty of space to bike in. And so that is where they headed. Now, eventually, Ricky got pretty nervous. He did not like breaking the rules. So he decided to turn around and head back to their grandparents' house because he wasn't comfortable with what they're doing. So he pedaled off having absolutely no idea that Amber would not be returning with him. When Ricky returned home without Amber, I've seen this described two different ways. I've seen that he was sent out to get her again and bring her home, but I've also seen that Jimmy just said he would hop in his truck and go and pick her up to bring her back home for dinner. But regardless of who went back and how exactly it happened, when they made it to this Winn-Dixie parking lot to look for Amber, she wasn't there. All that was left was her brand new pink bike laying in the middle of the parking lot and police. So just after Ricky had turned around to go back home, 78-year-old Jim Cavill called 911 after witnessing an abduction, the abduction of Amber Hagerman. So Jim called into police because he had just witnessed something very disturbing. He said that he was in his backyard, which is directly beside the Winn-Dixie parking lot, and he heard a young girl scream. 
When he looked up, he noticed a black truck had been stopped and sitting in the Winn-Dixie parking lot and the driver's door had flown open. A man came out, grabbed Amber underneath her arms off of her bike and then pulled her kicking and screaming into the driver's side door. Once the car was shut up, he sped off towards Arlington. So towards the center of town away from highway 360. Kevil told police that he had actually seen that black truck hanging out in that area for a lot of the day. So right beside this Winn Dixie is a laundromat that was not abandoned. And I guess the truck was hanging out in that area earlier. So it appeared someone had just been kind of sitting and waiting for an opportunity maybe. And the moment that she drove her bike into the parking lot, this person took it. The truck itself was black, as I stated, and there wasn't really anything that stood out on it, nothing to make it incredibly identifiable, like a sticker or um, a bent front bumper. Kevil also did not manage to see the plate, but he was able to say that the man that got out of the car was either Caucasian or Hispanic, was likely in his 20s to 30s, and he was likely under six feet tall. The truck itself was an 80s to 90s model, single cab, clear rear window with a short wheelbase. But I mean, we're in Texas. How many single cab black trucks that have no identifiable marks do you think are out there? It was determined that Amber was last seen wearing a t-shirt from Camp Hart. She also had on pink pants and brown suede shoes. And right away, like immediately, operations began to locate nine-year-old Amber. In the next couple of days, over 50 officers from not just Arlington Police Department, but also the FBI worked every single second, exhausting all efforts to locate her. Owners of all the black trucks in the area were questioned, at least most of the ones that they could get their hands on. They also decided to look into and question all the sex offenders within a one mile radius. Detective Ben Lopez, who was on this task force, said, quote, it was like if you weren't on another call, you were actively looking for her. We were looking everywhere in the city. Because family abductions statistically are more common, every family member was thoroughly checked, obviously. Nothing indicated that they would have necessarily done this, but you know, they had to keep this in mind. We also have the fact that her father was not really a part of the picture. There's always a chance, especially in a situation like that, that potentially that father all of a sudden wants custody and decides to come all that way to come and get the child. But they questioned everyone. They checked their homes. Polygraphs were done. Amber's grandparents' neighborhood was checked. Her own was strategically checked. But Every single one of these was a dead end. They found no sign of Amber whatsoever, and it became clear that this was not a family abduction. The media caught on to this very quickly as well, and Amber's photos were plastered all around town to try to spread word about her disappearance. So there was no lack of media coverage, and things like this were not incredibly common. So most people were aware that she was missing. However, had there been an Amber alert, they may have known sooner and been able to look out for things like this truck or a little girl with that certain description. But when they're getting that information days later, you can see how that can cause some issues. Donna continued to make pleas to the public, begging whoever took Amber to bring her back. But the family abduction ruled out, even with an eyewitness, the reality began to set in that the chances Amber would be recovered alive and well were growing smaller by the hour. And unfortunately, about four days after her disappearance, a gruesome and tragic discovery was made. There are some apartment complexes about five miles away from the grandparents' home off of Forest Hollow Lane. This apartment complex had a playground and from Google Maps, it appears there are some different trails and things running along a creek and someone was walking their dog in this area four days after the disappearance and ended up finding the body of a little girl in a drainage culvert. Arlington police arrived on scene and found something that they genuinely hoped they would not find. They so desperately wanted to be able to find Amber safe and well to return her back to Donna, but that's just not the way that this went. 
Amber was completely naked except for a sock on her left foot. She was face down in this drainage culvert. She was covered head to toe in bruises. And when she was turned over, it was discovered that her throat had been slashed. The community was broken. Her family was broken. Why would someone take an innocent nine-year-old girl in the middle of the day, like 3.30 p.m. probably, how could someone harm a little girl this brutally? And just the audacity of it all was shocking to everyone, shocking to the core. When employees of the apartment complex were questioned about if they saw anything strange, any weird cars, because if you think about it, that's kind of like a really easy way to blend in is by parking in an apartment complex where there's hundreds of other cars and no one's really paying attention to what you are doing. There's really not any other great way to get to the area. As you can see by the picture, there is River Rock Circle. It's kind of this swooped road off of a main road, Forestwood Drive. Maybe that's a possibility, but because there's so many just like family homes on that road and that's it, I just, I don't know. But when they spoke to the employees at the apartment complex, there were some maintenance workers and these maintenance workers said that they had actually gone to the creek the day that Amber's body was found and it was just hours before her body was found and she wasn't there. So this meant that Amber had either been recently dumped or it was also speculated that there had been a heavy rain recently and this made it possible that her body had actually been dumped somewhere else and had traveled down to the location where it was ultimately found. But you can see the challenge with this. This isn't even the area that she was dumped. Then the chances that there is a lot of physical evidence or anything like that in the area is just not very likely. Amber was taken to the coroner for an autopsy and I've seen kind of two different things on this and I'm not sure which one of them is correct because they it's like 50-50 depending on where you go. I have seen some articles and pieces of information state that she was killed within hours of being abducted, but I've also seen other things that have said that she was possibly kept alive for two days after her abduction, which I genuinely hope honestly is not the case because I cannot begin to fathom if she was kept alive for two days, the things that she might have been subjected to. And it was also found that it was either a knife or a screwdriver that had been used as the weapon to kill her and her cause of death was from her throat being slashed. Amber's funeral was held at First United Methodist Church of Arlington and dozens and dozens of people showed up, community members, friends, family, to show love and support for Amber's family. And I found a few articles where people were talking about going to the funeral and the fact that they just wanted to be there. They wanted to see Amber. They wanted to, uh, you know, understand the grief that the family was going through and be there for them through it. And it was really cool because a lot of those different comments were made even by some teenagers in the community that just genuinely had empathy and it made my heart so incredibly happy to see. Schoolmates of Amber's also created what they called the Amber Museum. They put photographs of her in picture frames, all of the things that she loved. They cut out little decorative pink hearts and ribbons and decorated it. It was exactly what Amber would have absolutely loved to see. And while the community and Amber's family grappled with such a devastating loss, police scrambled to try to figure out who on earth did this and would they do this again? From what they had seen in terms of the way the abduction played out, it didn't seem like this was something planned. This seemed more like an opportunity that was just jumped on. Police also believed that there could possibly be another witness. So as I stated, this is the middle of the day, 3.30ish PM when this happened. And the Winn-Dixie is in fact abandoned. There was no one there, but there was a laundromat next door and it was very busy most of the time. So police really kind of tried to keep that information out there that, you know, people at the laundromat may have seen or heard something. Did you see this guy? But unfortunately, I don't think this really led to a 
lot. From the way that I've seen it explained, this um, area of town, the population was mainly Hispanic and police were genuinely worried that no one was coming forward because they didn't trust the police. Tips did continue to flow in. I believe there were a total of over 7,000 so far in this case, but it seemed that every single lead that was chased just led to a dead end. They weren't really getting anywhere. Conversations in the community began because people wanted to try to find a way to prevent this from ever happening again, or at least solutions to help the community be more proactive and aware when it does happen so that maybe a difference can be made. And a woman named Diana Simone was one of those community members that really wanted to find a solution. So she ended up calling in to one of the local radio stations. She told them about a possible alert plan. She brought up the fact that you know, they're alerted over the radio all the time when there's like a severe thunderstorm warning. So she thought it might be beneficial if they did the same exact thing when a child was abducted. This idea resonated with the community, with the radio station. Everyone that heard about it was pretty much on board with this. So a Dallas Fort Worth radio broadcaster ended up meeting with the police to figure out a way to make this work. And the plan would be named after Amber, the Amber plan, standing not just for her name, this young girl who was abducted, but it also stood for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. And thankfully, local radio stations and the police managed to work out a plan. They found a way to work together so that these alerts could be sent out when a child was abducted. Essentially, immediately these different radio stations would be alerted when there was a potential abduction by police and all of the broadcasting would stop. This alert with the information would be put out there and the Amber plan was born. As the search for Amber's killer continued going on, the alert began to save lives and continues to to this day. So the first child that was ever saved from an Amber Alert is named Ray Lee Bradbury, and this happened in 1998 in Arlington, Texas. She was only eight weeks old when she was abducted by her babysitter. An Amber Alert ended up being sent out for her disappearance. It was broadcasting all over the local radio stations, and I kid you not, within 90 minutes, her babysitter's turquoise truck was spotted and police were able to go out to this location and find Ray Lee. She was dirty and hungry, but she was safe and they were able to return her back to her family. And I believe in like 2017, she went off to college, which is something that she may not have experienced had this Amber Alert plan not been in place. News about this Amber plan or this Amber Alert started to spread all over the place and pretty soon different cities and different states began to hear about this and they would call into Texas and call into these different radios and ask them how it works, speak to the police department because they wanted to create plans of their own. They realized that this was something that could hugely benefit the parents of missing children, the missing children themselves, obviously, and the police department because the police, there's only so many of them. They can only be in so many places, but when you have an informed public who can keep an eye out, that can make a huge difference. So a lot of different places started to incorporate their own plans. And by 2000, the Amber Alert program was started over all of the United States. It wasn't something that was like immediately kicked off in every single location. Places like different states had to come up with their own plans and then send that in, but it was happening. It was going to be all over the United States and it took a lot of hard work to make sure that that happened. So now we get to the criteria for the Amber Alert. And this is one of the main comments that I end up getting on my videos. People saying, well, should an Amber Alert be for every child that goes missing? Why can't it? Why is it only for abductions? Things along those lines. And there's multiple different alerts that are in place to try to cover the different gaps. Um, but the Amber Alert is just specifically made for abductions, which is when the community can be the most helpful because there is a requirement that a description of the vehicle or the person that abducted um, be given. So now with the federal involvement in all of this, they did see these down falls of the alert that they were a little concerned about, specifically the overuse or the misuse of the Amber Alert. Um, because of this, they added these basic stipulations and states can essentially follow this along with their own additions. But here's the main list of requirements. One, there is reasonable belief by law enforcement that an abduction has occurred, but it kind of goes hand in hand 
with another one, which is there's enough descriptive information about the victim and the abduction for law enforcement to issue an error alert to assist in the recovery of the child. So we're talking like description of a vehicle, license plate number. Um, so those two things, again, go hand in hand. Another one, the law enforcement agency believes that the child is in imminent danger or serious bodily injury or death. 17 or younger is another one. And then the child's name and other critical data elements, including the child abduction flag, have been entered into the National Crime Information Center system. So all of these things pretty much have to be in place for an Amber Alert to successfully go out. So the way that it works is once all of those different things are established, Amber Alert is first sent to the radio, TV, lottery, Department of Transportation. That's when you get the alerts on your phone, um, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those different things. And after that, it is sent to NICMIC, again, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they basically take over to broadcast the alert as far and wide as possible to the smaller different areas that it's not as easy to broadcast to. Ways of broadcasting have changed so much as the years have gone on. Keep in mind, this just started over the radio and now it's everywhere you possibly look. The addition of digital billboards also made for a very easy way to broadcast this information out to people traveling on the highway. Since you're looking for a car, having someone's license plate plastered all over the digital billboards is definitely going to be helpful. And to this day, according to Nick Mick, as I've stated, if this has helped to rescue over 1,100 children that have been abducted at least and it's very difficult to kind of determine the exact number because sometimes it's just hard to say if it's the Amber Alert that helped, um, you know, locate the individual. Anna has said, quote, it's another legacy for my daughter that she didn't die in vain, that she's still taking care of our little children as she did when she was here. So I'm very proud of my daughter for all she has done for our children here. But in the same breath, she also said, quote, there's another part of me that wonders what would have happened if we would have had the alert when Amber went missing? Could it have helped to bring her back to me? And seeing that quote absolutely tears at my heart in half. And that's why these situations are so bittersweet because you want something so positive to come out of something so awful and it's great when it does but at the same time it is one of those things where you really wish it had existed before and that it didn't have to take the loss of someone or all of these negative horrible things to happen in order to make that change to begin with. So while the Amber Alert has gone on to save so many lives just in the United States alone, it's still been 26 years and Amber's killer has not been caught, but the case is definitely still on the minds of those involved. In 2021, they had a pretty big press conference that they held in honor of Amber and Arlington Police Department also wanted to encourage tips to come in because they have not stopped looking for whoever did this to her. They established a brand new tip line. There's never really been a lack of tips. Um, as I said, there's about 7,000 alone in Amber's case. They also at this time offered a $10,000 reward to try to really entice someone to come forward with information. As I had said prior, they do believe that there could possibly be someone out there who saw something, someone at that laundromat. And they're hoping that maybe after so many years and all this time that they can pull someone out of the cracks and get them to come forward with the one tiny piece of information that may help solve everything. On top of that, they also decided to release some photos that had been taken uh, on the scene that day where Amber's body was found, as well as a map to show the area. I'm not exactly sure what their goal is with that. Um, it just shows part of that culvert and then just where the culvert is in relation to everything around it. Um, maybe again, to just jog someone's memory of you know, were you in this area? Does someone you know go to this area? Sergeant Gilden, who is now on the case, said, quote, a lot of people will refer to Amber's case as what's commonly referred to as a cold case. But for Arlington Police Department, it has never been listed as a cold case because we've never gone 180 days without having some lead come in. And he said this in January of this year. So 26 years and they have never gone longer than 180 days without a lead. 
That is wild. It has been announced by police as well that they're hoping advancements in technology, which is another huge thing that I could honestly endlessly talk about in, in terms of how it has changed solving crimes, but they're hoping this will help solve the case. They have stated that they did in fact recover DNA at the scene and they believe the DNA belongs to the person responsible. Things in the late 90s, DNA testing, it was still just a baby. It was like the mid 80s when DNA testing really started going. And then even then it was incredibly expensive, not very easy to access for a lot of different police departments. At this point, so much has changed and it's just the tiniest bit of DNA. You can use genealogy and somehow find out exactly who that person was. They also stated that they plan to send the DNA along with other pieces of evidence in for testing late 20. 2021 and it can take a while. So I'm over here sitting on the edge of my seat, hoping that something is found in the next couple of months. Arlington police have also claimed that they have other physical evidence that they have maintained and kept this entire time. And they're not releasing what this evidence is, just that only the killer would know about it. So again, this isn't a case where there's just nothing to work off of. They're just waiting for the right things to fall in line and pieces to finish the puzzle. And this may be like a really idealistic way for me to look at the situation situation, but knowing that the death of Amber turned around and ended up saving so many others, there's this part of me that really hopes that all these years later, now the advancements and changes in technology are able to turn around and give back to her. Um, so I've really got my fingers crossed on that. Sergeant Gildan has also come forward with theories that could help narrow down who the attacker is. Gildan has said, quote, based on the direction of travel when they left, and then based on her being found in Arlington, being abducted in Arlington, and just being in that spot, the question has always been, did somebody have a connection with that area where the abduction was? And then in another quote, we do believe you'd have to be somewhat familiar with that area to know where that creek is. Was there a connection with that location? And was it someone who had a reason for turning back to the center of town? The thought has always been that the easiest way to get out of the area would have been to go to Highway 360. What is being insinuated during all of this is that it's very likely this attacker was someone local. This is someone from Arlington. Um, this isn't some stranger passing through. I have a map up right here, but you can see where she was taken. I will have that. And then if you look, 360 is just like two blocks away. So if someone wanted to get the heck out of there, if it was some random person passing through, they would have hopped on 360. But also because she wasn't dumped until four days later, you wouldn't have someone from far away come all the way back to Arlington and dump them there. This is someone nearby. Um, and honestly, I kind of wonder, was this person going back to their home? But I feel like at that point, it would have been easier to identify the person. If this is someone that lives in town, in that area, somewhere between where she was taken and where she was dumped, or at least the direction that this truck had it off in, I feel like if you knock that down to like a couple mile radius, find all the black trucks in that area, even if you just drove past every single dang house, I feel like someone would have been found. So maybe it's someone living on the outskirts of town or possibly someone in a town over. I mean, there's Fort Worth on one side, there's Dallas on another, and then you've got like these smaller towns scattered throughout with farmland in between. It had also been said by police that they believe something specifically triggered this attacker, something psychological more than likely. Gave a couple of examples of this, which are pretty much all of the typical ones. Um, losing a job, losing money, um, losing a partner, an argument, you know, something pretty big and drastic that just sent someone into emotional turmoil and they snapped from feeling out of control. It's just so difficult to me because this was such a well-known case in this area and still is such a well-known case that if there was anyone in that area that maybe noticed a coworker acting strange or, you know, a partner acting off, anything that you would typically look out for after something like this were to happen, 
I feel they would have come forward at this point, especially if that person is driving a black truck or they know the um, person that they're worried about drives a black truck. So I don't know, maybe this was a loner, someone kind of more off by themselves and maybe they potentially lost a job. They stuck to themselves. So no one noticed they were acting weird. Honestly, I just genuinely hope this person is eventually found. The Amber Alert is now used in all of the United States, Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, multiple other countries. Not only has it brought children home, but it's apparently also acted as a deterrent, which is not something that I'd ever really considered until I saw it mentioned on the Nick Mick website. So there have apparently been circumstances where children have been released by their abductor once the alert goes out. They hear the alert, they hear the description of their vehicle, they hear possibly their description, their license plate number, and they say, oh crap, let the kid go, and they're off on their way. I'm hoping that technology advancements, all of the different things happening in science will give Amber's family some answers. The Amber Alert, as I've stated so many times throughout this video, is definitely something beautiful to come out of this, and it saved so many lives, but I feel like it's Amber's turn. It's Amber's turn to have some justice and to have some peace. I really want to see this come full circle. And as I end this video, I want to say something that is probably the one thing that has been on my mind since I decided to create this video and speak about Amber. And I really hope this message resonates with you guys and at least makes some sort of a difference. I know it can be easy to hear the Amber Alert go off on your phone or your radio or your TV, and it's easy to ignore it. It's easy to ignore when the digital signs on the highway go from saying, buckle up, click it or ticket, to an Amber Alert and a description of a vehicle. It's easy to see and hear these things and either click the alarm off on your phone and not look at it or... Um, you know, just quickly see the billboard and passing and just move past it. But the next time you hear an alert, get one of those loud noises coming into your phone um, or you hear it over the radio, take a moment to remember Amber and what happened to her. And then while you're doing that and thinking about what she had to go through because there was no chance for her to be saved by an Amber Alert, Think about the over 1,000 children that have been saved, that have been returned to devastated families that are so scared they will never see their loved one again. These children that have now been given the opportunity to go to college, to get married, uh, to start a business, to live their life, to go to sleep comfortable again at night. And it's all because someone took a moment out of their day to look at the alert and stay aware. I am so incredibly aware that it is easy to get irritated by the noise. It's easy to just overlook it. I feel like when you get so used to dings going off on your phone and then your emails and all these things, and there's so many signs everywhere, it's easy to let the important ones slip by and go through the cracks. But as I said, let this video and these words be a reminder to be someone that makes a difference, okay? It's okay. Take two seconds out of your day to read the Amber Alert. Take in that information. You can possibly help make a difference and save a child. If it was your child, you would want someone taking that time for them. As a mother, I would hope and pray that someone would take the time for my children. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and go, you guys. I have another pretty well-known case that I'm going to be speaking about after this video. Um, it's another one in this series. I really wanted to hit off the main ones that are most widely used and important. So I'm excited to get you guys that video. I hope you're enjoying the series. I hope you walk away learning something every single time and maybe with a new perspective or maybe, you know, next time you're not going to silence your phone when an Amber Alert goes off. I'm going to go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Amber's story and learn a few things with me. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.